We're headed to Huntsville. Have we got everything we need? Probably not, but uh, we're Let's going see. anyway. We got uh, radios. Yeah, we do. We got antennas. Yes, we do. And we now we have air in the tires. Yes, we do. And new windshield wipers. And brand new windshield wipers. Because it's been so hot this summer, it's dry rotted the old ones. Sounds like we're ready then. Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 44. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And we've got a, a bonus show lined up for you today, don't we? We do have a bonus show. We, I wanted to call it 43.5, but I guess we're going to go for 44. Yeah, let's go for 44, a nice, even number. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we were sweeping the cutting room floor, and we found uh, a lot of footage here that we had not used in season six. And it was kind of timely that we, we get it on out there. Yeah, it kind of uh, wouldn't have really fit at a later date. Yeah. So uh, we thought we'd get together and give you an extra show this time and, and get that on out there. We're going to talk a little more about that contest we've got coming up uh, a little later in the show here. Yeah, that's some good stuff. There's already a lot of interest in that. Sure is. Uh, Jim and uh, Peter and Emil are not with us today. Um so it's just Tommy and I? Yep, holding down the fort. Yep. I think we can handle it. Oh, wait a minute. Look who just showed up. Hey, the other Tom friend. Tom. Hi, Tom. What's going on over in Georgia? Not bad. Not bad. Busy getting ready for the show tonight and uh, working on getting ready for uh, the 40th anniversary. Uh, going to be over there in the next couple weekends. Oh, we're going to be seeing each other in a couple of weeks, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, if anybody doesn't know, the 40th anniversary of MFJ is coming up and, uh, we're going to see a lot of different people there, uh, including yourself and uh, hopefully uh, a lot of other people that we ran into at the 35th. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, October 5th and 6th uh, coming up in Starville at the MFJ factories. There, there's three or four buildings there that they have, and we'll get uh, the grand tour of all of them. Yeah, yeah, I really uh, had a great time at the 35th anniversary, which was obviously five years ago. Uh, they do have the uh, tours of all the factories and everything, uh, Muratron, uh, MFJ's plant, uh, Mer uh, High Gain. Uh, the only one I didn't quite get to was the uh, metal fabrication shop with the silk screen, and I didn't get to see that one, so maybe we'll uh, yeah. try to make that one this year. Yeah, I didn't see that one either. I saw everything but that, so we must have been thinking alike last year. This is the 40th anniversary, and they're going to have a special um, event station on the air too, K5MFJ. Yeah, that's great. They're going to have the special event station because uh, we're going to try at least uh, see if we can work it for about a half hour or so, try to make some contacts. So, uh, but it's going to be uh, great. Uh, W5KUV, from what I understand, is going to be streaming. So uh, if you can't make it, you can always watch his uh, live web shot. They're going to have free lunch, too. You're going to miss out, Tommy. You're not going, are you? I, yeah. Well, I, I had plans on going, and I didn't find out until yesterday. I've got to go. Uh, see about my son and uh, college. Yeah, uh, new college. He's going to change. So it looks like I'm unfortunately I'm not going to be able to make it. Yeah, free lunch at uh, McKee Park. Uh, free tailgating too. Are you bringing anything to sell, other Tom friend? Yeah, the free the tailgating. I don't know if I'm going to have anything to bring. I'm mainly going to take a lot of video and walk around and talk to people. Uh, the last time I was there, I did buy a. Uh, two meter and a uh, six meter uh, loop, a metal loop that uh, one of the guys were making there. Uh, MFJ, Ameritron, Cushcraft, High Gain, Mirage, Vectronics, and MFJ Metal, uh, factory tours of all of those locations. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. You know, we did it a few years back. I think Wayne's gonna be there maybe again this year as well. And we know uh, you're gonna be there, Tom. Our uh, friend Ray Novak from ICOM will be there. 
Not sure who all else just yet. And they're having... Yeah. Uh, Tom, W5KUB will be there. Yeah, He'll Tom be Mettle. broadcasting. That's uh, right. You can check out the stream from his site. Well, yeah, and as far as who's going to be there, um, yourself and um, myself are going to be there, if that means anything to anybody for me being there. Uh, but Tom Medlin, W5KUB, will be there. Uh, and this is as far as the website is as this weekend that I've seen. Um, Ted Randall from the QSO Show will be there. Ray Novak from ICOM. Uh, Chip and Janet Margelli, mm -hmm. uh, Chip from uh, QS, uh, CQ Magazine. Uh, Janet Margelli, the manager out at HRO in, uh, in um, California. Yeah, Bob Heil had planned to come, but uh, some uh, concert changes came up and uh, prevented him from, from making it now, so he won't be there. Uh, we'll miss him, but they're going to have door prizes too, so you could win some MFJ, Ameritron, High Gain, Cushcraft, Mirage, or Vectronics projects, uh, products, excuse me, <laughs> products there. Could be projects too. They, have, be those project, they yes. have those as well. They, they, they have everything. Yeah, and we have a little bit of uh, some MFJ projects sitting here on the table we'll talk about a little later in the yeah. show here. So, other Tom friend, we're glad that you were able to stop by with us today. I know you've got a show coming up here in just a few minutes. What are you going to be talking about on uh, your program today, and where can viewers find it? Oh, yeah. Tonight's show, we're going to be doing, uh, we're actually going to be talking about uh, promoting ham radio through social media and the internet. Uh, we're going to be bringing up a couple different podcasts and bloggers and uh, YouTube video people. And um, they could find that at um, hqaradio.com. Uh, the live show is every Sunday night, uh, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Or you can go there after the fact and download any of the episodes from that show. Okay, great. Well, good to talk with you today, Tom. It sure was good to see Tom again, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I sure hate I'm going to miss him at the uh, MFJ thing. But uh, anyway, I'm sure I'll catch up with him sooner or later. Yeah, well, that's just more fried chicken for uh, him and me. Yeah, you guys have a piece for me. Okay, we right. sure will. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get on into the show here. And the first email I've got is from Dick. W0MPH, and he says, I've been a ham since 1952, and I'm still learning from the program. He says, I'd like to know what vice that is you use to assemble things. I haven't been able to locate it, and I'd like to buy one, and I, I think maybe others would like to purchase it, too. It looks very practical in the way that you use it. And, uh, Dick, oops, it just came apart on me. You mean the one you used to use? <laughs> no, I still use it. I just didn't have the knob <laughs> tightened here. This is a Panavice, and there's a variety of, of different models of it. You, it's got a ball here. You can swivel that thing around every which way you want it to get that piece that you're working on just in the exact right spot. A uh, very handy little deal. Uh, there's, like I say, a number of attachments. Here's one here. You can slip out the regular jaws there and put in this one that uh, holds printed circuit boards. So uh, a lot of different attachments for it. It's very nice device you can find more about it at panavice.com cool that's pretty nice actually might have one of those too so I've, I've got an email here from our friend arthur ab4rl says he enjoyed watching the icom 2820 review on the most recent episode he has a question about how often the fan comes on when you transmit he says he used to have an icom 2 meter 440 mobile um, but every had one drawback every time he transmitted the fan would come on no matter what well, the power level you know, was. I've, I've seen a number of different brands of rigs that do mm -hmm. that yeah my actually i think my 857d does that as well yeah, yeah it's, it's not uncommon but anyway he says it was noisy that when he took it out of his mobile and put it into his shack he had to use the remote mounting kit to uh to to move the fan away and it, it does do the same thing but i haven't really noticed it being a problem I mean, yeah. the, the fan comes on, and it actually comes on every once in a while, even if it's just sitting there. If you're if you're monitoring, um, I guess the threshold where the fan is is kind of low, yeah. but it, I guess that keeps the gear cool. Well, it helps it with the life of it. Yeah, you you want to keep it cool. And the solution, talk louder. <laughs> but the, it, it hasn't been a problem. I actually have it in my truck under the seat. I, I don't ever hear it at all. And yeah. when the when the radio was in the shack, I would hear it. But it's not that loud where it you know, really bothered me. So, But uh, uh, there are quite a few that do the same thing, as you said. Yeah. Well, our reason, or one of the reasons we're having this uh, bonus show today 
is because Wayne and I went to the Huntsville Ham Fest here a few weeks back and had a big time, and somehow we slipped up and didn't get any of that footage in episode <laughs> 43. Yep. Yeah, so you guys benefited from it. Yeah, so uh, let's, let's take a look here at uh, George and Wayne's excellent adventure. We made it to Huntsville right here at, uh, what is this place? Uh, the Von Braun Center. Standing in front of the fountain out front, we're going to go in and check out the Ham Fest here. I've heard for years that this is a good one. I've never been before. Uh, neither have I. I've uh, been licensed since 1983 and have wanted to come, but this is the first time I've ever been able to, and it looks like it's going to be a good one. There's a lot of folks out here. It sure is. There is a line at the door up there. Well, actually, there's like three lines at the door backed up all the way out, so... We're going to get in line and go get our tickets and see what the Huntsville Ham Fest is all about. Man, that's a great ham fest. Oh, I wish it was. I wish I could have gone this year. I remember last year when I went, it was awesome. It's probably the closest thing to Dayton we have down here in the south. It was. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's a lot of work to put something like that thing together. Yeah, well, I, I talked with uh, Charlie Emerson, the guy who heads up that ham fest. We met Charlie Emerson, N4OKL here, who's the chairman of the Huntsville Ham Fest. Charlie, I like it. Well, I'll tell you what, that is good news to us, and we appreciate you guys coming and uh, and doing the, the uh, filming or whatever you call this now, I guess, documenting. Yeah. And uh, any of that, that that we get from the guys that uh, do that, Ted Randall, yourself, uh, others, and uh, Ted, uh, Ted, I mean, uh, Tom Medlin, and, and those, we really do appreciate it. And we appreciate you giving us the opportunity to, to kind of plug the Huntsville Ham Fest. We, it's, uh, it's those media outlets like yourself and others that have really helped us to try to grow the show. And uh, this year, we have, uh, we, we, we've taken a pretty good step up the ladder this year. We had a bigger crowd yesterday than we've seen since I've been doing it. And uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a mob scene yesterday uh, coming in. And, and, and those of us that have been doing it a long time, there's some ladies uh, that do that. They're called the Haylarks. And there's some ladies that, uh, that take care of all of the stuff out front. And they take on the tsunami of uh, people. And, uh, and they have records uh, all for back 20 years or more. And they can tell you how much money that we've taken in at any stage of the, of the operation here. And they can go back and check that out. It's something that's just unbelievable. But, uh, but they told us yesterday that we uh, don't know any numbers yet or anything for sure, but we were way ahead yesterday uh, from that time last year. And so 
we believed it, uh, that, that what she was saying there, because uh, it was such an, uh, a big group of people that came in at one time. And, and what, it, what it was, uh, that that crowd kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And that's what kind of surprised all of us, because we always, you know, the first rush is a great big thing, and then it kind of, you know, dwindles down a little bit. But, boy, they, they were stacked up outside there past uh, 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And, boy, let me tell you, that's the kind of thing that we all love uh, to see, of course. It's a great ham fest, I'd have to say. It's my first year to come over to Huntsville for Jackson. And, uh, yeah, like you say, the first day we were backed up out there. Yeah. It felt like out to the street trying to get in, <laughs> yeah. but it wasn't quite that far. But, right. uh, yeah, a really big crowd, like you said, elbow to elbow. You could right. hardly get around in here. Now, today, it, it looks like any other ham fest on the last day. It settled down just a little bit. And um, today would really be the day, if you want to look around, you can get around here today, yeah. and, and there's not a lot of people in, uh, crowding you out, so you get a little chance to talk with the vendors and Absolutely. learn a little more than you could yes. you know, on the most crowded day. But uh, how, how many years is Huntsville been doing this okay the first huntsville ham fest was not called the huntsville ham fest it was called the uh the north america north american north alabama uh ham fest and uh shortly after that that was in 1979 and what we did in those days which i was not with the the ham fest at that time long after that is when i came on i came on about 10 years ago but uh, what they what they did up until then because of i don't know the, the size of the ham fest growing we uh we shared uh, th uh, three spots in North Alabama to have the, the Huntsville Ham Fest. Huntsville was just one of the spots. We'd use another city in, to the west and a couple other places, what two other places, and things started kind of kind of going down a little bit uh, as far as attendance goes and all of that. And the, the, my predecessor, who was the president of the Huntsville Ham Fest Association before me and for many years, uh, Mr. Don Tunstall, W4NO. And uh, he was a, a really smart guy that knew how to how to do these things. And uh, he put this, and he said, "Look, if we can, if if all of you guys will agree that we do the Huntsville Ham Fest in Huntsville, he said, I'll do my best to grow that ham fest." Started out, we were in one of the shopping centers uh, back before I came here, and they outgrew it and uh, went to another place, outgrew it, and then we wound up down at the uh, Von Braun Center. The Huntsville Ham Fest has been going uh, since 1979, been called the Huntsville Ham Fest since about 1980. So we got a got a long history. Well, congratulations, Charlie. Thank Great so Ham much. Fest. Yes. I'm glad we came over here. It's, it's my first year, and uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. You, you got you got all the right vendors here. Great. And, oh, we love to hear it. Boy, especially from people like you guys that have been around and saying we love those kind of uh, comments, you know, so thank you so much. Well, that was some good insight into what's behind the Huntsville Ham Fest. They, they do it a little bit different than most Ham Fest. Yeah. And it's working for them, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a great one. And yeah. If any way possible, I will make it to the next one. Yeah, great location. Uh, a lot of support at that one. I'd highly recommend you go visit it if you can. We'll have a little more footage from the ham fest throughout the show here but right now let's get back to uh, a few of your questions here and the first one comes from bill he says uh, i've got a question that's outside the norm i'm studying for my technician ham license right now and i have the equipment in my garage that i, I just used to listen to right now and my question is is there such a thing anywhere in the u.s as a repeater dedicated to computer talk of any kind he says, I'm an IT guy. I'd, I'd love to find a forum to discuss those topics. And uh, thanks so much for everything you guys contribute to the field. What do you think about that, Tommy? Any uh, repeaters dedicated to computer talk? Man, I'll be honest with you, almost all of them are. Well, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, most of the guys are, it sounds like you are just like us that are into computers and radio. And pretty much everybody, the rest of the hams out there have similar interests. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't have any trouble finding someone to talk to about it. But as far as a dedicated place, I, I don't know of anything. I don't know of any uh, specifically dedicated full time to computers. But I bet if you did a little searching, you could find some uh, nets or some conferences mm -hmm. that are uh, technology related. 
and be a certain uh, you know time each week where a group of like-minded hams will get together and discuss those topics. But uh, just do a little search around the internet. I'm not sure what terms to tell you to type in to find it, but I, I know there's there's probably groups out there exactly like what you're looking for, and uh, I hope you can connect up with them. And good luck on your test that's coming up soon. Yeah. Congratulations in advance. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got one here from uh, Jason, KE7VZW. says he was watching some episodes of Amateur Logic on the big screen, and uh, he's talking about his HDTV, not the theater screen. Not the we theater. haven't made it there yet. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm... Ho hopefully one day. Yeah, we're, we're working on it, but yeah. <laughs> don't hold your breath. <laughs> anyway, he says he saw a reference to Ham Radio Deluxe and how Linux had no equivalent. While true, he was curious if we'd seen the FL Rig Suite from the author of FL Digi. Aesthetically, it may confuse some hams into thinking that it's not on Ham Radio Deluxe Heels, but it's hot on its way. That sounds pretty intriguing. Mm -hmm. Curious if you've heard of FL Rig, your users might be well served to see if their software is closing in on Ham Radio Deluxe for Linux equivalent. W1HKJ is really a mad genius. All the best. So that's uh, that kind of throws the gauntlet down. I guess I'm going to have to check that out now. Oh, uh, you haven't looked at it yet? No, I haven't. I I, uh, I looked at it. I, yeah, I guess I sent you that email until just before the show, huh? But the, yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't seen this one yet. But uh, uh, this is a, very intriguing. I, I wonder if it'll run on my Raspberry Pi. That sounds hey, like a good project. You know, it might. I, I haven't researched that far. I did go look at some of the screenshots. So it's a nice looking little package. Uh, not uh, graphically maybe as pleasing as Ham Radio Deluxe, but I think uh, one thing that it's got going for it is that you can set it up to work with most any rig. So if your rig's not currently supported, uh, there's commands that you can enter in, and I'm not sure the terminology they used, but you can essentially uh, write uh, macro to scripts to work with any ham rig that's out there. Okay. Plug in your own cat commands? Plug in your own cat commands. Yeah, that's cool. So, uh, yeah, very interesting idea there. And we'll have to look a little more into that. That might be just the perfect Raspberry Pi product. Yeah, it sounds, uh, sounds great. Appreciate you turning us on to that. We stopped by the Flex Radio booth there to talk with Greg Jurens about the new Flex 6000. Hey, Greg, good hey, to meet you. how's it going today? Good. You guys had a good show? I had a pretty good show, been kind of busy, a lot to see here. I still haven't made it all the way through. What about Flex? Have y'all uh, been busy in here? Absolutely. Yeah, it's been great. Of course, we, we announced our new Flex 6000 Signature Series at Dayton this year, and the response has just been insane, very much overwhelming, uh, way beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, um, you know, it was when we started Flex Radio 10 years ago, we brought Software Defined Radio to the ham space, and we thought, well, this is pretty cool and had a great time. And since then, we've done, you know, our Flex Series line. When we did the announcement of our new Flex 6000 direct sampling radio, the same thing happened again. It's just been crazy in terms of response. What is direct sampling? Well, a great way to describe direct sampling is imagine being able to capture the entire amateur spectrum, say from 10 kilohertz to 77 megahertz in one grab and then drop it right into memory. Well, once you have it into memory, then you can do exciting things like, say, look at a little spectrum here and a little spectrum there. So we've done the spectral capture with the spectrum capture unit. Now we can slice the bandwidth up into band units. We call them slice receivers. So in the case of the Flex 6000, you can have either four or even up to eight slice receivers in the same radio at the same time in real time. And, and that's multiple bands then, huh? Absolutely. There's no reason why you can't be watching, you know, chasing that DX station on all the bands he's active on or... Uh, I'm a six meter guy, and so I, I might be wanting to watch two different six meter beacons while I'm working HF, while I'm playing on VHF on the 6700, and listening to AM broadcast all at the same time. I, a lot of it's visual. Uh, frankly, you can watch a band to see if it's open. You can watch to see where the pileups are. And so we see, we expect a lot of visual and audio type of feedback, plus output to things like CW Skimmer and digital mode programs. Imagine working PSK31 with your friends while you're up the band a little ways watching uh, RIDI, that, that sort of thing. So there's a little bit in it for everybody. Uh, plus, being an, an, a network-connected type radio, this is an Ethernet-based radio. You know, with the future 
and, and I say future because our first release, it'll be local area network only, but eventually we'll be able to do wide area networking. So you'll be able to have all these features with a radio that's either you know, here in your shack or even a thousand miles away, or better yet, I can grab one of your receivers and see if I can hear the guy that I can't hear with one of mine. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, the thing I like about um, the Power SDR software and the waterfall display and all is, say, during a contest, say like maybe field day or something, you can just look and see where all the signals are and just click, 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 go right through them without having to sit here and spin a knob. Yeah, absolutely. For the last 10 years that Flex Radio has been in business, we've really pushed this idea of see it, click it, work it. So this is the Flex 6000 right here? Yeah, this is actually the Flex 6700, and this is one side of it. This is actually the, the, the Logic and RF board. Uh, behind those two fans are some very impressive uh, field programmable gate array and media processor engines. One of the big changes between our existing Flex Series line and the new Flex 6000 series is that we've moved the heavy lifting, the digital signal processing and all that, back into the radio. So where we have very tightly coupled control over it, we're reducing latency and providing efficiency, and that's how it allows us to capture the whole band at one time. So that's a, that's a rather significant change. The PC now is not doing the audio decoding or any of that. So, so does this run standalone or does the PC still have a job? It's a great question. The answer is yes. And, and by that I mean the radio will stand alone, but you the human still need some way to interface to this radio. Be that your laptop, a desktop, perhaps in the future some sort of pad device or something else. And so Look at the PC as being your human interface, but the radio itself does indeed operate as a radio, but it still needs some sort of human interface. Basically, all I would need to do is plug my microphone in. Now, is this mic level or line level or both? This is line level. On the front is mic level. Okay, so I plug my microphone in, hook up an antenna, plug a Cat5 connector just into my network? Into your router, and then connect your PC that's I'm sure already connected into your network and uh, the thin client and I mean it's a very thin client will run on your PC uh, imagine kind of a browser on steroids kind of client um, I like to tell people that th the radio is doing so much of the of the heavy lifting that even most of the pan adapter information is being generated in the radio and then just shipped over like a real-time movie so your PC is basically a dumb terminal at this point, or just a browser type of... Yeah, it's more than a dumb terminal. It's a nice graphics browser style kind of terminal, yeah. And so for all those folks that are saying, well, what about Mac OS X? What about iOS? What about, you know, Linux and those other things like that? Is that we've designed it as a client architecture. This is a radio server. So you will hook up your thin client, and it, it really just allows us to develop new clients in the future. That's great. Now, could more than one people connect and, and listen? Or is it strictly locked down now to where only one guy's getting in at a time? It's a great question. The radio is designed for multi-user. Uh, what we, when we release initially, it will be limited somewhat in the ability to see, to see lots of users. But as we add that wide area networking flexibility, we're also going to add the ability to add on software to do multi-user. When can we expect this? When will we be seeing this on the market? Well, we, when, we took, uh, when we announced a Dayton, we made a commitment to begin shipments in the fourth quarter of this year. And I'm happy to say that we are still on track to do that. The hardware is in great shape. Uh, we've actually passed the first of our major hurdles in terms of compliance testing. The, everything looks great. All the performance looks good. We've released what's called the production package to our manufacturing group. And so now it's that SMOP, simple matter of programming. We've got a lot of software left to do, and we, but we feel good about it, and I think we're on track for timing. Greg, thanks for talking to us. I have another email here. This one is from uh, Chris down under. VK4FR, and he says, uh, I also have acquired a Raspberry Pi and recently had a loan of a D-Star Handy Talkie. I don't know a lot about either, but I'd like to try to combine the two in one project. I live in uh, Townsville, North Queensland, Australia. While I've had the loan of the HT and DVAP, I took them both in my car with the DVAP connected to a laptop and 
Then Hot spotted my mobile phone. Uh, he used the, the data link on his cell phone, mm -hmm. and he was able to remain connected while he was mobile. And that that sounds like a great, you know, a great way to work, D Star, if you've, uh, you know, got that data plan on your cell mm -hmm. phone, and you're traveling. But he says he'd like to run a small box with a Raspberry Pi, a DVAP a DC power supply and some uh, small screen input devices to create a portable D-Star hotspot. Tommy, do you think we're at that point? Um, is that possible yet? Uh, the software is not there yet. I would actually want, like to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I did tell, talk to Robin Cutshaw, the guy that read, created the DVAP, and he supposedly is uh, considering creating a standalone command line client that'll run on the Raspberry Pi. I believe there's some support, some support for a BeagleBone, mm -hmm. uh, which is similar to the Raspberry Pi, uh, but I haven't looked into it yet. Um, that's uh, basically a Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have this quite the same hardware, but uh, anyway, it's about a $90 device. Yeah. So what is out there right now for uh, the DVAP or the DV dongle Linux-wise? Uh, there's a Linux client, just a regular Linux client, but um, it doesn't run on the Raspberry Pi yet. Okay. So there is a, a client that runs on the Raspberry Pi that makes your DVAP a network-enabled mm -hmm. device so you can connect to the client from another place. I don't really see the point yeah. in that, but, but that's what's available right now. Okay. Well, so. maybe that'll come along in the future, and we'll, uh, we'll try to stay up to date on that. So... Uh, uh, Chris, today, no, there's not a solution for what you want to do uh, with that Raspberry Pi, but it's still real early in the ballgame. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't show up sooner than later, because yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, call for that. Yeah. Well, while we were uh, in Huntsville, we also ran into a young ham there who's got a lot of exciting things going on. I've run up on Andrew, KB3NUG here, who's at the Huntsville Ham Fest. Andrew, what brings you out here? Uh, well, I came uh, to talk to Robbie Spear from Gigaparts and uh, uh, Ray Novak from ICOM. Uh, the UAH Space Hardware Club uh, just got accepted for a pro uh, our proposal for an Eris contact just got accepted, and uh, we would like to borrow an, a radio, a uh, 9100 from ICOM, and uh, I'm talking to the ICOM representative Ray Novak out here to see if we can get that set up. Great. Tell, tell the people what uh, ARIS is. Well, ARIS, uh, ARIS is uh, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, so it's an educational uh, uh, outreach program from NASA. So uh, they uh, set a time aside for an astronaut to be a, uh, a ham, radio, uh, ham radio operator astronaut on board the International Space Station uh, to talk with us, and, and we're actually going to have uh, students from a local middle school uh, come into our communications lab and uh, talk to the ISS directly through Amateur Radio. Yeah, that's that's a great activity. You've got something else you do with Ham Radio too, don't you? Uh, yes, uh, next year, hopefully in 2013, um, if not 2013, then 2014, uh, the UAH Space Hardware Club will be uh, launching a CubeSat, um, and we'll, we it has uh, it'll be a 70 centimeter um, downlink and uplink, and um, it's uh, actually at Johnson Space Flight Center now with uh, its team. Um, they're doing microgravity testing on the Vomit Comet. Wow. Well, that, that's interesting stuff. So how long have you been a ham? Um, I think I got my ticket in uh, 2006. 2006, I was, I think, 15 years old. So, um, And uh, I hadn't really done much with it, but until I came to university and got involved with this club and actually drew me into the club, they, they said, oh, you're a, you're a ham radio operator. You should join the Space Hardware Club because we need more guys like you. So... Um, and the Space Harbor Club's been a great, great club at uh, UAH and uh, really hands-on, hands-on engineering experience that you don't get anywhere else. That's great because you, you don't find a lot of that in schools anymore. And it sounds like you have a really good club here, probably, uh, I, I guess, probably a little better than a lot of the colleges these days. Well, I hope so. But, uh, I mean, we have, we have a lot of programs uh, in the club. We, uh, we do the CANSAT competition down in, in Texas every year. Uh, we do high-altitude ballooning. We also use uh, APRS extensively for, for high-altitude ballooning, um, CubeSat, and now ARIS. So we have a lot of programs that, uh, that get, get future engineers involved uh, working with hardware and, and, uh, and working with amateur radio. 
So do you think you'll go to work with NASA when you graduate? Well, if not NASA, then SpaceX or one of the other private contractors. And uh, uh, I'd love to work with communications equipment and avionics and uh, control systems. So, yeah. oh, Great. Well, good to talk with you, Andrew. I'm glad you uh, stopped by and, and gave us a chance to, to see what actually is going on today in, in amateur radio and with space communications. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It was nice meeting with Andrew. He was a really sharp character, man. I tell you, some of these kids that are in some of these technology programs at the colleges today are going to be our next generation of ham radio operators, and they're doing all this space stuff. And, of course, there in Huntsville, boy, what what better place to do it? Yeah, that's uh, Grand Central for space stuff right there for sure. Yeah. I mean, he looks like a pretty amazing kid. Yeah, so congratulations on the projects there. We, we look forward to hearing more about them. Tell me, what have you got on your email stack over there, or is this something else? Actually, this is from Twitter. This is from our friend Peter on t Peter from Twitter. <laughs> Almost a tongue twister. MI0VAX. He says that he likes the segment on the 2820. It made him think about digging his out again. Never got around to figuring it out last time. Uh, Peter, dig it out and send it to me. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead and dig it out, Peter, and uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, take a little bit of time and uh, look over the manual. It's not that bad. Once you get a few of the basic things down I showed on the segment, it uh, kind of falls natural after that. So you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Speaking of D-Star, here's one of our D-Star buddies here, Tommy. I ran into Ray over at Huntsville. Of course, he and I have been spending a lot of time together. Uh, it seems like for the past summer, you know, we've been accused of yeah. green screening him out on some of the Ham Nation shows oh, and yeah. all. But, <laughs> you know, he's actually here in the shack because he's, he's got uh, family connections in yeah. this part of the country. So uh, it was good to run into him again. And we'll be seeing him at MFJ here in a couple of weeks, too. Yeah, you keep rubbing that in. Yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring you back a chicken bone. Yeah, bring me back a wing a with wing. some meat still on it. Here's a man who needs no introduction. Hi, Ray. Good to see you again. Hi, George. Yeah, I've had a few folks that said I'm hanging out with you too much. We have been hanging out a lot. I had someone asking me about that a moment ago. Are you green screening Ray in? I said, no, he's actually there. Yeah, but tonight we head northwest, so we're going to average about 400 miles a day, take six days to get home, see a few things on the way. So tell us about the Huntsville Ham Fest. What What's your impression of it this year? Well, Huntsville's always one of my favorites because I grew up not too far from here. I had family that lived in Huntsville and always enjoyed going over the Space Center. But this year has been a real good show for us. We had a lot of booth traffic, got to see a lot of, a lot of people that I haven't seen in the last couple of years. And they had various reasons. Luckily, none of them were health reasons on why they haven't come. But we had real good traffic through the booth. And we saw Bob in here yesterday. He... He was uh, over here, and you're all hanging out around the Gigaparts booth. Gigaparts has done something special this year, haven't they? Well, they started doing this about four years ago where they wanted a store inside the Ham Fest, and they really pushed the local uh, ham club to go, hey, we're here local in Huntsville. And while we have other dealers that come in that can mail order and take advantages that way, we want to show the local community that we're bringing our entire store. So they, they've set up inside uh, the uh, curtain area as they would in the regular store, and it's very nicely set up in there. And uh, Last year, I think they had a couple of vendors inside there instead of their own booth, and then Bob did come in his bright yellow pants and red tennis shoes and Hawaiian shirt. So he was definitely uh, a loud signal yesterday. Oh, and, and um, yeah, we ate with him last night. He changed his wardrobe. He had on the purple tennis shoes and the purple sports jacket. Yes, that's true. That's true. My wife would correct you, though. That was a lavender sport oh, coat. Lavender, okay. But, yeah, Bob is always fashionable. I guess it's all those years of running around with the rock and roll guys. I guess so. Uh, well, good to see you again. I, this is my first trip over here to Huntsville. It's been a blast. I think I'm going to have to come back. Yeah, and you'll probably, after you get to the Mississippi border there, you're going to start going, man, this trace is a slow road. <laughs> yeah, we actually took the interstate instead of the trace. We go down to Birmingham and cut across, but uh, not too bad, five and a half hour drive for us. So uh, we're, we're going to hang around to the end, I think, and 
see if we can win some of these prizes. Hadn't won anything yet. You know, I seem to be more successful giving away stuff than I am winning it. Well, I can understand that. There's always people wanting us to give away stuff, and actually this would be one of the contests that you are eligible to participate in. Yeah, that's true. It is. And uh, I, I didn't buy my one ticket. I didn't buy the hundred that some folks were doing it. You know, I don't have time to sit there and write my name that many times. Oh, then you haven't seen the professional ones that have their own stamp from the sign man over here, you know, the one that keeps doing the ham nation. He's got stamps, and guys will sit there and stamp away. <laughs> good to talk with you again, Ray. Hey, George. It's, uh, good to see you again. So I don't guess we'll see each other for uh, a while yet. but uh, Oh, no. October. That's right. Mark the calendar. The big MFJ open house and. Um, Day Boy, in the park, I think. Day in the open. park, yeah, that's what they call it. I call it the open house because I get to go in and and see how they build that gear, and that's that's really some interesting stuff. Oh, it is, it is, and uh, I think I'll share with you. There was a a couple of PowerPoints online that took tour of our facility. So when you do another tour of MFJ, we'll we'll show ours as well, and it's completely different. Oh, I guarantee you. <laughs> All right, Ray. We'll catch you on uh, on the show. All right, be safe, George. Yeah, it was good to visit with Ray again, and uh, looking forward to seeing him here in a couple of weeks. You know, he used to work for MFJ. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I heard him tell me about that at one time. It was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So it'd be like homecoming for him. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk a little bit about this uh, seventh anniversary amateur logic contest we've got coming up, Tommy. Yeah, seven years. It doesn't seem like it's been a day over. I was going to joke like I do with my wife about my anniversary, but yeah. uh, it really doesn't seem like seven years. It seems like it just doesn't. yesterday. Yeah, it really does. We've got some great prizes and some great sponsors here that that uh, have teamed up with us to uh, give some lucky viewer out there a complete HF rig. Uh, the whole station. Yeah. Uh, ICOM is providing the IC7200. Nice. That's, uh, a, that's a nice radio. That is a very nice radio. We have actually played with it here before, and it, it didn't arrive um, via uh, the carriers this week, so we hope that we'll have it in the next show. Well, we know we'll have it in the next show and show you a little bit more about that great 7200. Boy, what a nice rig. You know, you can use that thing um, as a base. It makes a perfect go kit, and you could even use it mobile. I mean, it's not that large that you could not use it mobile. Yeah, and there's uh, actually there's some software you can get for that thing and actually remote it, audio, everything. Yeah, and we did that in a... We sure did. I don't remember the episode number now, but uh, we did do that, and it worked. And, and mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times those those type of things don't. But mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it was great. Yeah, and we've got a power supply over here, too. Uh, t yeah. Who's that from, Tommy? Yeah, this is from our friends at MFJ. I, I really like this. I didn't know they had one that was quite that small. But that's a 30 amp power supply. 30 amps. And uh, let's see, it's got variable voltage on it. Uh, yeah. You can uh, show it to our audience here. Oh, well, you were looking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it also has a switch so that you can look at uh, voltage or current there. You can choose whichever one you'd like. Boy, that thing is tiny, isn't it? It is. I really like this. That's uh, very nice. Yeah. Uh, nice. Appreciate those guys for donating. Yeah, and not only that, MFJ's uh, given us another item there, haven't yeah. they? Yeah. That's uh, the uh, tuner. Yeah, the 925 auto tuner. That's that's pretty handy. You know, you can uh, you can get a manual tuner and use that with your rig, and and those work fine. And nothing wrong with it, but. It's a little quicker if you got auto tuner. I know you mm -hmm. don't have one, Tommy, but uh, yeah, not auto tuner. Mine's yeah. uh, old school. It's I, an MFJ tuner. It's a great tuner. Yeah, well, well, mine is too, my uh, main one. But in the uh, mobile, I do have an auto tuner, and it's mighty handy just to be able to dial in a frequency there and punch a button, and mm -hmm. it's automatically tuned for you. Uh, so that's that's some great stuff there. And not only that, MFJ is also giving us. Uh, a couple of off-center fed dipole antennas here. I believe a 40-meter uh, and an 80-meter version. And, of course, the off-center feds work uh, multiple bands as well. So, you know, that's uh, complete coverage. Yeah. Basically, everything you can work on HF with yeah, those antennas. Great. I use an off-center fed at the house. I use a homemade one, but that looks a lot nicer than the one I built. Yeah. 
And of course, you're going to have to hook all this stuff up. So they also, uh, we, we got in touch with the wire man. You remember the wire man? Yeah, oh, man, I love the wire man. The wire man gave us some enhanced RG213U cable here. It's a, a really good looking large coax. And we've got 50 foot of it that's going with this package. Oh, yeah. There we yep. go. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, this, these are not Tommy's <laughs> gold mother load. <laughs> yeah. These are actually a couple of, um, from my private stock here, we're going to throw in the package there so that you've got some coax connectors to put that together with. We actually, uh, we may need two more, Tommy, because they're going to need a jumper over to that uh, rig there. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll donate a couple out of my private collection I know you've as got well. them. I've got some. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, we were thinking, well, what happens um, if this uh, the person who wins is not a general or not an extra? You know, they're just a technician and we're giving away an HF rig. Well, we got a solution for that, don't we? We do have a solution for that. Um, our friend uh, Gordo is going to donate a uh, study guide. So yeah. You can upgrade. Uh, Gordon West Radio Schools is going to donate... Uh, in the case we have a winner who's a technician, he's going to donate the uh, general uh, study guide, uh, the complete course. Uh, if the winner happens to be a general, he's going to donate the extra study course. And what if the winner's already an extra, Tommy? Well, you get a pat on the back. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. And not only that, not to be outdone by Gordo, <laughs> our friend uh, Bob Howell at Howell Sound is also going to donate one of those great ICM microphones specially designed to work with ICOM rigs. Nice. That That's going to round out this, this setup. That's the full package right there. It sure is. Everything you need to get on HF. And some lucky amateur logic viewer is going to win this thanks to um, ICOM, MFJ Enterprises, The Wireman, Gordon West Radio School, and Howl Sound. That's a nice prize package, Tommy. And it I, is. I would like to have that myself. Yeah, and I see down here in the rules that the amateur logic people can't enter. So, well, this yeah. will be my last show. <laughs> 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 well, uh, yeah, let's tell you a little more about it. What is? Uh, what do you have to do to be eligible to win this, Tommy? Well, you have to be a licensed U.S. amateur operator, at least a technician class. Um, there's only one entry per contestant. Sending one more than one will disqualify you, so please only send one. The winner is responsible for any taxes incurred. The winner agrees to use his or her call sign and name and promotional and news items related to the contest. And contestants must not be, this is the kicker, employees or affiliate of Amateur Logic TV, ICOM, America, MFJ Enterprises, Heil Sound, Gordon West Radio School, or The Wire Man. Okay, and uh, how do you enter? Well, you don't enter just yet. You know, we're this is the seventh anniversary special from Amateur Logic, so this is an extra show you're getting here. October the 15th mm -hmm. is when the contest is going to open up, and we'll have all these prizes here and show you a little more about them. And uh, we do we know how we're going to do this yet, Tommy? How, how can people enter, or are we still on the fence on that? Yeah, I think uh, I think we're going to have them email information. Email. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll give you a special email address when the contest opens there, and we'll just want some basic information from you, nothing special. And uh, so Monday, October 15th is when you'll begin. Uh, we'll start checking those emails, and uh, that will go through Saturday, December the 8th. So you got a couple of months there to uh, get your entries in, only one entry per contestant. And uh, we're, we're hoping, you know, this is going to be a random drawing now. We're not uh, uh, picking out anyone on any special merit. It's right. just going to be a random number drawn out of uh, all the entries we get. Right. We hope that somebody who doesn't have an HF rig already will win this, but y you never know who's going to win. Everybody has equal chance. Everybody has an equal chance. And if for some reason we determine the uh, winner was not qualified, then we'll just do the drawing again right. until we get someone who is qualified. Uh, more details coming up that on the uh, 7th anniversary special on October 15th. So join us then, and uh, we'll tell you more about it. Uh, Tommy, although Peter is not here today, 
he did leave us something in the mailbox. He did. Hello, everyone. Recently, I read on the internet about how one could actually take a TV tuner dongle and by using just a driver and some specialized software, actually turn that into a scanner capable of tuning across a wide range of frequencies. So I went out and I purchased this. It's a New Sky Mini Digital TV Stick and it comes with this little dongle and this little antenna. So let's give it a try. The first consideration has got to be, well, which, uh, which dongles out there can I actually use? If you go to this link here at reddit.com, over on the right hand side under resources, you'll see a link to tuner compatibility list. Click on that and you'll find a list of uh, dongles telling you and also they'll tell you which ones are compatible and which ones aren't. Once you've uh, got selected the dongle you want and purchased it, then go over to rtlsdr.org and here you'll find software software for Windows, Linux and OS X. I'm running Windows or Windows 7 and it tells me that I need to download SDR install.zip and unzip it. Then double click on the install.bat file to have the script download everything you need, including a program called Zadig. Now, I've already done all of that. And in my computer here, I've got now a subdirectory as a, as a result called SDR Sharp. At the bottom of this list is a program called Zadig. Uh, do I want to allow the, the following program from an unknown publisher to make changes to this computer? Just click yes. Go to options, list all devices. Uh, use the drop down box and select RTL 2832U. And then click on install driver. And a few seconds later, uh, the driver was installed successfully. And close all that down. Now that's all you need to do in terms of driver installation. All we need to do now is run the program called SDR Sharp. Uh, what's it saying? Error loading SDR Sharp. I always get that error when I run the program. Not sure why, but it doesn't seem to affect the running of it. So just click OK. And lo and behold, here's SDR Sharp. Now I'm going to need to tell it what frequency I want to operate on. So I'm going to type in 105 uh, in the center box. Hit enter and uh, that's 105 megahertz. Now I'm going to select wide FM out of the various options in the top left hand corner where it says front end and it's grayed out. Next to it is a drop down box. Select RTL SDR USB and we're ready to roll. Just click play and we have some noise. This top box here is a graphical display of the various frequencies around 105 megahertz. We've got a waterfall display below that. I can zoom in on the frequencies using this slider bar on the right hand side. As I said before I can select from narrow FM, wide FM, AM, lower side, upper side, double side band or various CW options uh, in the top left hand corner here. Now the grey area or shaded area in the middle here I can drag around like so and if I put it over that lump over on the left hand side and that's as you can hear uh, triple M FM here in Melbourne now that's interesting sometimes when I drag it over a radio station I'll actually get the name of the radio station popping up and also the track being played it uh, appears to be a new addition to the radio stations I hadn't thought analog radio stations had that kind of encoding but uh, I've noticed on a couple of radio stations uh, that they uh, are actually seem to be uh, adding it so that's rather useful 
Anyway, I can alter the bandwidth of the signal that I'm listening to just by dragging the edges of this uh, grey area in and out. So the narrower I get, the worse the signal gets. So the signal, or I should say the audio quality, is excellent. It's better on the classical music stations. You, you hear the... Uh, uh, it, you hear just how good it can actually sound. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the frequency to 151.000.000, which is 151 megahertz. Over on the right here, you can see I can drag the frequencies up and down. Uh, over on the right here, you'll see a number of different peaks. I'm going to select narrow FM. We'll zoom in on them a bit. And those are narrow cast radio stations serving ethnic groups around Melbourne. I think that's actually a Sri Lankan station. S some rather good music on it. Sort of Bollywood. Now if I drag all of that down a bit towards 148 zoom out a bit here we go see those little peaks those are actually pages give it a sec the bane of every two meter amateur radio operator and if I go down to the two meter amateur radio band well there's not a lot happening down there unfortunately it's Sunday evening at about uh, 20 to 8 so um, it's a little disappointing. Uh, we really should use our bands a bit more. Uh, now, if you look around at the options down on the left-hand side here, you'll see there's a squelch facility. As I said, you can alter. Um, it's like a, a volume control. And what else we got? Oh, you can alter the filters. But basically, that's... Um, uh, the main controls are the ones that I've covered there. Now you'll be able to go from about 66 to 1700 megahertz and there's a whole range of different transmissions including aircraft that you can actually listen on uh, uh, within that range. So there you have it, a low cost scanner capable of tuning across the VHF and UHF bands from about 66 to 1700 megahertz uh, and uh, capable of receiving quite a number of different modes. How good is that? That looked like so much fun, Tommy. I ordered one myself. Yeah. Do you, do you get the right one? Because they're not all equal. I think it's... I got the right one. I did, you know, look at that link and, and choose one from there. Yeah, I think most of them, based on that chipset, will work. We just some of them have a little bit better capability. I, I think so. Yeah, there's a Mac and I believe a Linux client for that thing as well. Uh, some software to make use of it. Yeah, Pretty you know, neat. I've got some SDR kits here I built <clears> before, but most of them work down in the HF bands and... And this thing works up in VHF and UHF, so that'll kind of help, you know, mm -hmm. spread it on out and uh, give me my full daily requirement of radio goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's more radio goodness than one person can handle. Man. Well, I think so. That's a, that's a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> well, I've got one final thing here on the email stack, and uh, this came from Frank Johnson. He he didn't give his call sign, but I believe he is a ham, and. Uh, he just sent me a link and he said, check this out. Wire glue. Have you ever heard of wire glue? I, I have never heard of wire glue. It doesn't sound uh, reliable. No, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, it doesn't seem, sound reliable. I have to check it out and see how yeah. that works. I think I'm going to stick with my leaded solder myself. Yeah. Glue typically is okay for some things, but... Man, that's a lot of pressure, yeah. and it's not much surface to bond. Maybe some, some hot wire glue would yeah. be better. hot wire. There you go. Yeah. You heat it up with a solder and iron. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> okay, everyone, we've enjoyed it. Don't forget uh, the MFJ Day in the Park celebration, their 40th anniversary, October 5th and 6th in Starkville, Mississippi. Be there or be square. And the AmateurLogic.tv, ICOM, MFJ, Heil Sound, Wireman, Gordon West Radio Schools. Did I leave anybody out? I uh, think you covered them all. Yeah. Special thanks to those guys for donating yeah. the prizes. Uh, we'll be uh, 
kicking that contest off when? We're going to kick it off on the next Amateur Logic episode, and we will take entries up That's through October 15th. Yep, October the 15th, and we're going to accept entries through December the 8th, and the winner will be announced on the December show. Yeah, December just, 15th show. Just in time for the end of the world, Net. Just in time for the end of the world, Net. We are yeah. planning on holding that, by the way. More details forthcoming. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that, that's going to be... Uh, that's going to be quite a contest. Somebody's going to get a nice prize there. Well, we hope you've enjoyed it. Great show, Tommy. Yep, I had a great time. So we'll see you next season. Yeah, we'll Whichever see you next it season. Seven three. Seventy three. We'll see you next season. Next season. Yep, next season, man. Season eight. Season seven. Season seven. Is that right? It's been seven years. So that would be the start. The first one would have been season one. So it's the beginning of the seventh year or the end of the seventh year. <laughs> this can be all rolled out on the end Yeah, here. let me get my calculator out. Yeah. This would be... Started in 2005. Yeah, this is 12. So, this is the beginning of We're the We're going to look real dumb on here, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll see you next season. Yeah, we'll Whichever see you next season. Is.